Well, hello. Uh, my name is Adam Griffith. I am the director of an effort called the Revitalization of Traditional Cherokee Artisan Resources. And I am officially employed by the North Carolina Cooperative Extension in Cherokee, so the Cooperative Extension Office. Uh, but the effort is funded through the Cherokee Preservation Foundation. So this is one of their initiatives to preserve culture within the Cherokee community. Uh, RT Car came into being about 15 years ago and focuses on environmental preservation with the specific purpose of increasing the availability of resources for tribal artisans. The primary resources that we're talking about are basketry material, material for their traditional arts and crafts like blow guns, uh, carving, masks, and so woods uh, come to mind as well as river cane, which is where we're standing today. We're standing uh, up Caney Fork and Caney Fork was named years and years ago for the river cane growing here. And it's just one of hundreds and hundreds of place names across the United States that have cane in them. Caney Fork, Caney Branch, Cane Patch, Cane River. Uh, all over the United States, particularly in the southeast where the cane is, is native, uh, there, there are place names with cane in it. Um, and this is no exception. So driving up and down Caney Fork Road just past campus, you probably saw dozens and dozens of patches of river cane. And once you start seeing it, you, you just, it's very hard to stop seeing it. Um, it's, it's not as tall as the non-native bamboo, um, and it uh, is evergreen, so you'll see these green patches persisting in the winter, but it's, it's a pretty uh, unmistakable plant once you get the hang of identifying it. River cane is actually an amazing plant. Uh, we can divide up the benefits into a couple of categories. The cultural benefits are significant for the Native Americans that have used it. Uh, the cultural benefits extend not only beyond the Cherokee historical territories, but to other tribes as well. Uh, one historian called it the plastic of southeastern Native Americans, and it was used for a wide variety of things, not just basketry and blowguns, but in everyday household items like sleeping mats, mats for preparing food, used in the houses themselves, in the walls, in the roofs, uh, used to catch fish in the rivers, make fishing creels out of them and just on and on and on, a wide variety of uses. It, it really is a, a, a amazing plant uh, culturally. One of the amazing things about being inside a cane break is seeing all the different habitat niches for the animals. On the floor of the cane break, you've got this thick, fluffy leaf litter layer with fluffy light soils underneath and there's a lot of mole, vole, shrew, and mouse activity in there, small mammals, raccoons. Um, next, where the stems are, the culms, uh, and then up towards the top, we have the canopy. And so when the river cane is fruiting and producing seed, this is a huge food source for birds and other animals as the seeds fall to the ground. Uh, the river cane basically is two thirds biomass above ground and one-third underground. So one-third of the mass of the plant is below the surface of the soil and about two-thirds is visible, is what we're looking at above the surface of the soil. Uh, river cane has some anatomy associated with it. Uh, this is not a stem but a culm instead, spelled C-U-L-M, and where the branch comes out there's often a small groove called a sulcus, S-U-L-C-U-S, and this can be used to help identify bamboos. Here in the mountains, we have river cane and hill cane, also known as arrow cane by Native Americans. River cane grows quite tall, as you can see behind me, uh, up to over 20 feet in height, but the hill cane only grows to about six feet in height. It can be anywhere from one to six feet tall. Size should not be used, though, as the primary way to tell the difference between river cane and hill cane. If you're not sure, and there is a large enough quantity of it, a cross-section shows that the hill cane has a very, very small lumen or hole in the middle of it, and the river cane has a, a very large lumen. Like all bamboos, river cane is a grass. It reproduces primarily clonally underground. So this entire wall of river cane behind me could be one genetic organism.
Environmentally, some of the benefits of river cane include reducing erosion with the dense network of rhizomes that we're standing on, uh, hold the soils together during flood events. The water is significantly slowed down because of the large number of stems, uh, technically called culms, that uh, grow in a dense patch of river cane like this called a cane break. So that dense network of rhizomes hold the soils together and then slow down the waters significantly during flood events. Research has shown that water coming off of an agricultural field will percolate through the soils where river cane grows and river cane can actually remove excess nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment at a higher rate or equal to a riparian buffer of mixed species. Uh, it outperforms all other grasses, ryegrass, switchgrass in academic literature, and it just does a great job improving the water quality and keeping excess nutrients out of the water. This is a problem because excess nutrients in the water promote algal blooms or algal growth and can decrease food availability for fish and natural uh, benthic organisms. When agriculture took over in the southeast, a variety of factors pushed river cane to the extent that we're seeing it today. Now it tends to persist just on a narrow fringe next to a body of water. Most of the cane breaks in Western North Carolina are confined on one side by a body of water and on the other side by a road or railroad or a mowed field. So very seldom do we see river cane extending to another ecotone, such as an upland forest or a slightly different ecosystem. Another factor is the sale of land in the mountains. A lot of people move to Western North Carolina and the Southeast in general for an escape from the city. They come, they buy their piece of paradise on a body of water and they mow down the native plants and the non-native plants that they see for a view of the, of the river. And we're seeing that in a lot of different places. In terms of restoration, the easiest way to restore a plant is to plant the seeds. But in this case, the seeds are very hard to come by. The flowering and fruiting of river cane is poorly understood. Some bamboos operate on a genetic clock and flower and produce seed after a certain number of years. There are species in Japan, for example, that produce seed only every 76 years. And nobody actually knows the fruiting and flowering regime of river cane. Because of the complex flowering and fruiting of river cane, Relying on seeds as a source of plant material for restoration is unreliable. What we're doing a lot of now, however, is transplanting river cane. Where there is a patch that is large enough, we're using machinery or hand tools to dig up river cane and move it to a new location where it has more room to expand. 